Hello everybody, Also Nim speaking here, preparing another vlog. Um, I have been writing a few subjects, a few points that I would like to talk to you guys. This week I had um, really positive feedback. I want to begin today by thanking you guys for all the feedback that you're giving um, in class and on, on the YouTube channel as well. Um, it's been very um, positive for me since it's something I'm beginning now. I haven't quite got the flow yet, um, but um, it's been very positive. I even had some people who emailed me and said that they haven't trained Capoeira for a very long time and they are coming back to Capoeira because of the vlog. And I think what has happened is if you have a connection with Capoeira from many years ago about training, um, of course music and all of that, but mainly about training, physical, and then you stumble uh, with something like what I'm, what I'm doing now, talking about Capoeira, it might give you a depth about an art form that you've fell in love with in the past. A, dif a different depth and you actually think different. So you're not, not only associating all the physical benefits that you had when you trained Capoeira, but you realize that there might be so much more to Capoeira than you knew. And I think that makes people feel like they want to investigate more, they want to practice more, because now you can go to class you can train in Capoeira, but you've got all this other universe that is starting to flourish um, in front of you, which is the universe of music and the universe of um, the oral tradition of Capoeira. Um, the points that I made this week are some of them quite specific. I would like to do a vlog to talk about Bananeira because I know how we are all so passionate about Bananeira. And I have a lot of points about Bananera because for me, Capoeira really, this is, it is going to sound biased, but Capoeira has such a unique way of handstand. It's different from any other type of art form that I have seen that deals with hand balancing. In Capoeira, we treat it so unique. Um, and I have my, my take on that, why I think it's so unique. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave you waiting for that <laughs> a little bit longer because I was looking for some notes and looking for some things to talk about and I found a book that I wrote many years ago, okay? And I would like to start with this book. I, I haven't spoke much about this book before because I wrote this, um, and I felt maybe something just for me to, to practice, for me to think about, and perhaps was a little bit teenager-like, the content. Um, so I, I felt that uh, it's very good, but I didn't think of really sharing. I think now I'm ready to share this book with you guys. Um, so basically, um, I made some drawings, like this one here, this one here, that's a star. So there are different chapters. I'm not sure you can really see that one, but it's supposed to be three birds flying. Um, and it goes on. And, and so basically each chapter just have a little drawing that represents um, the chapter. Now, uh, at that time I was reading a, um, I was obsessed with Japanese culture, I'm still obsessed with Japanese culture, but I had a time where I had a really difficult time, I was um, not living at home, and I was just reading and reading and reading. And I read this book, I, I remember my grandfather had a book called Shogun, and I remember feeling that this is such a cool thing because it was a very thick book, <laughs> and I had this idea that Obviously, the thicker the book, the harder it was to read. <laughs> um, so I remember as a child thinking, um, when I grow up, I want to read that book. And I did, indeed, I read the book, Shogun. It took ages, but um, 
I finished the book and it's a fascinating book about um, um, Japanese um, culture, samurai, the time of samurais and the ninjas, all of that. So for a martial art lover, it's a fantastic book and the plot is amazing. But um, that book led me to start reading a lot of um, philosophy on, on martial art and Japanese martial art. Um, and then I read the Book of Five Rings, which I'm sure some of you know about. It's a fascinating book. And I was so inspired that I started to make some notes that it kind of drew a parallel to Capoeira, okay? Uh, but let me get to the point a little bit more. So the first chapter, the first drawing of this book, it's, a, a, it's supposed to represent a drop of water. And that's to represent water and to represent flow, fluidity. Now, anybody who has studied martial arts for some time have heard about water and well because of course we have very famous quotes from Bruce Lee about being water um, I'm not going to quote that because we we all know that but indeed it because it's actually so obvious now it's sometimes easily forgotten and it's actually quite good to be reminded about the power of water the power of flow uh, because it's well and good to say that and to sound philosophical and to sound, oh, I want to do that, I want to move like that. But then actually getting some points where you can really practice that. It's what I'm interested in telling you guys some things that I have done um, that I think actually really helps this, okay? So I think flow, the idea of to flow like water, um, even the, the, even the, the poetic meaning behind even as an artist you really think of the fluidity of water and that's very good already but I think what happens is when you flow you give I made some notes here I'd like to read so to flow is to give you an opportunity to communicate with a part of your brain that wants to move so whenever you engage in flow in capoeira whatever you have been doing so you do something, you do something else, you do a practice, you do a training, and it's cut like that, which has its value to learn. I learn one thing, I learn something else, um, then I go back to that thing that I've learned. But whenever you learn something, for the most simple that, that could be a, a jinga, to a sequence, to a whole class, if there are times that you can then apply flow into what you have then learned, you will, as I said in here, connect to a part of your brain that adores that, that wants to do that. And your mind will give back to you straight away the confirmation, this is good, I need to do more. So continuing with this, it creates a positive addiction, a real taste for continuity, so you will get addictive to that. Now, if we think about another vlog that I did about motivation, started talking about motivation, we are going deep into something that is no longer just philosophical, but it's something that you can apply. I'm now saying that just the fact that you can flow will give you another tool for your motivation. When you master flow, you connect, you connect the knowledge that you have, okay? I quite like this phrase because it's saying that the knowledge that you already have wants to flow. Whatever knowledge you have accumulated in your practice, you have that now and that knowledge now wants to move in fluidity, wants to flow wants to have a sense of continuity so you want to make that change um, you want to make that conscious change for now of something that you have learned transforming into a flow and you can start with simple as I said with a jinga um, the power of jinga must never be underestimated um, most teachers that I know have always told their students jinga 
you must jinga, you must jinga, and it keeps being repeated like a mantra. And maybe for few reasons. One, that it is also easily forgotten. Two, if you understand jinga, you understand that all your movements will have what we call jingado. So, how would you like to have a beautiful melo de frente? Let's say a kick like melo de frente, that has a nice fluidity to it. If everything that is coming before that kick, or indeed after that kick, doesn't have a fluidity. So in other words, we'd be saying that you have a stiff jinga, and then pretty much that stiffness will start to make a signature of everything that you do. Now, of course, none of these, as I very often say, none of these are rules. You can break that. You could have a stiff jinga and have an incredibly soft au if that's what you want. You can do that, but you had to make a conscious um, effort to do that. And I think that perhaps goes a little bit against the, the natural course of fluidity. I think it's much better, much more positive that you have a nice jingado that came from a place of practice called flow, called fluidity, and you will carry that in your joints. Your joints will get so used to that fluidity that everything that you do can carry that costume of fluidity, can carry that signature of fluidity. I'll give you an example. Yesterday in my class, I taught a sequence it's so simple. It's the hapa de arraia, meia lua de compasso. And as I duck underneath, as I do a cocorinha underneath, so say the kick is going this way, going to the right, I'm using my arm in to duck. So I'm not just ducking underneath, I'm using my arm in, and then I turn my hand before I come up. So I also indicate that this arm it's aware of the base leg. It's aware that that base leg could come up to my face. I haven't touched the person's leg. I haven't blocked anything. I just flew, used fluidity to go from one place to another in that manner. But I needed to do that in a jinga-like way. So just that simple action of turning your arm from here and think of that cupping of the hand you're, you're moving there, and then instead of just thinking elbow, thinking of the cupping of the hand, bringing the arm, creates that flow and gives a really powerful signal to the other person that you are very much in control. That's another thing. It is quite powerful to flow. It shows, um, it shows if, you sh if one thing that flow once masters can do, um, once you master flow, it shows that you enjoy what you're doing. And we all get captivated by that. You just need to watch a dancer, a singer, any performing art. If you can match the skill, if that dancer has skill, or a skill that you appreciate, that you like, that, that, that type of dance, and you can see that that performer is also really having a great time enjoying that is so much more motivating and powerful to everybody that's looking than just a great skill i do talk about this quite often because we we do see artists in all areas in capoeira of course i'm talking about capoeira they have great skill but lack a little bit of maybe that passion for for the Sometimes you may lack passion for your own skill. You have an amazing skill, but you don't yet know how to show how much you appreciate your skill, how much you have worked with your skill, apart from the fact that you can show a quantity of movements or, or a sharpness in movement, which I, which I very much value as well. But what I'm saying is that those changes, changes are really good, but we may get hooked up with the idea of just change for change's sake. And I think that change have to also mean improvement. So let's change, but what about that change? It's creative and it brings some improvement to what you're doing. Um, 
playing the devil's advocate here that perhaps that there is value in change for change's sake because you are experimenting things but certainly when you have an amount of information that you then know how to channel a little bit more you want to change to directions that you already more or less know you will find or you will uh, or you're more likely to find your answers otherwise changes may become a little too random okay all of that with an open mind because you may be in one direction and then actually realize that that's something else you want to do so i very much believe in narrow training and broad mind i'll say that again i believe in narrow training and open mind when we say narrow training people may not understand fully what i'm saying i do believe in focusing your practice to one thing now that one thing i don't mean one movement or anything like that but what is the thing that you're working at the moment so you focus that but your mind is open for perspective for all the informations which is why i say i i do value my students having workshops and classes with, with other masks of course i do that's because that will give you precisely that will give you a perspective will, will challenge your technique i did speak about this in another in another video where i say uh, to to go somewhere go to another hall and and visit another hall that will really add to your capoeira because you will give you that challenge you then have to shift your environment you know and if you get just comfortable with our environment i try as much as i can to challenge the envir environment of my students you know so although they're coming back to the same the same room the same people around them but i'm quite lucky i don't have i always have visitors very often i mean almost every class definitely every class that have hotter i have visitors so my students do get that even though i encourage them to visit other people but they do get um challenged by other capoeiristas challenged in a positive way but we even, even when we don't have people visiting for why or whatever i i make a conscious effort to challenge them whether in practice so today we're going to have a class that they they're going to work harder than they have worked before and i can tell that sometimes shocks them a bit they go maybe a friday class where friday class is a harder so it's a different vibe from hard training but some days my friday i'm gonna okay we're gonna train hard today I didn't tell them that I just do and I can tell in the beginning they sort of adjusting to that they are caught by surprise and then after a while they adjust and indeed if the class is great and there's a strong content to it they after they come and say that was a great class why because nobody should get so comfortable that you absolutely know that class is going to be exactly like this and I'm going to come to class and this is what I expect because then you program your mind for a type of class and if it's not exactly how you have program you may get frustrated well how can you do that we're not obviously we're not robots and it may be so many things i may get a phone call from a, a master and that i haven't spoke for a long time and talk about uh, some a new books come out in capoeira and they must and i call it there's a new book and then it will tell me a story and that's it my mind is inspired in that and i absolutely have to release that energy in class tonight i have to come to class tonight and go right we, we're playing this song today i've just i've just got this song from this master from brazil and i'm very inspired and we've got to use it so it's here i'm not gonna hold that let that energy die just because my timetable says that today is like that it cannot work like that because then you're cutting improvisation skills you're cutting your ability so what i find now that my students state that most of them actually now they actually became used uh, they be, they became um, used to the idea that they will be challenged so if i if i have a class where it's quite different from what they are used to that day they already know okay with let's embrace this because there's something there that we that we need to embrace and 
And make no mistake, that kind of practice will be carried into the Hoda. Wouldn't it be the most boring thing that Hodas are always exactly the same? If they are, they have to change. That's not a, one Hoda should never be the same as the other. They can be better, they can, you know, we can make some strong notes on where the music was good, where the music wasn't good, but the fact that they won't be the same, you know, it's it's what makes exciting to us. So that change should come with improvement. Now, coming back more than to the idea of flow, one thing that I do that has helped me a lot, and I had to learn this almost by force, because well, let me just start by saying that in my school, uh, my teacher, Mestre José Antonio, has that. He has nailed the idea of flow. If you ever go there, if you're not used to the class, the first thing that will suffer is your back. Because you will jinga. You will jinga a lot. I very much miss and I love to be in a class where you just jinga without this expectation of what's the next and we're going to do this, going to do this, going to do that. I mean, if there is next and there is this and you have to do this, that's great if it's coming from, again, a, a natural flow place. But the idea that you can just jinga for a while without looking at the clock, that for me has capoeira printed on that type of training. It's a seal of approval for me that you can jinga without looking at the clock. Now, it is hard for us if we have one hour, one hour and a half. But when it can be done, it's, um, it's very meditative. It's, a, it's an opportunity to really clear your mind. You would think that by doing the same thing, your mind gets distract, distracted. It may for a little bit, that's fine. If you study meditation, which by no means I claim to be an expert, I'm not an expert at all, but I have read a few books and I've seen a few things in the world of internet. And we even have reports from masters of meditation who have spent their whole life meditating. And they will tell you that some days they cannot go more than 10 breaths without getting their mind distracted. Once maybe a beginner will, will breathe for two, three breaths and the mind is get, getting distracted. And that master, it's saying, after five breaths, six breaths, my mind has wandered away. I had to, to bring it back. Um, so if that could happen to a master that has it, you know, and, and it's all, all, obviously it's all about the improvement that the, the next breath and the next breath. So I suppose getting that extra inch is really valuable. It's not pessimistic to think that. It's very optimistic to think that. But you would think that, but it doesn't really happen. Normally, when you enter flow, a state of flow, your mind doesn't get distracted. Sometimes it doesn't even have time to get distracted. So, before I tell you some, actually, pra a practice that I do, that I, that I told you I had to learn almost by force, um, it's important for me to tell you as well that I, this idea of perspective, it's really important. But I do believe in the narrow practice, in training, in, in an environment, okay? I want to make that clear, that statement, because it always sounds biased and it has the, almost that quoting on the politics. But I want to be very open about this to the fact that I don't believe in very regular practice in different styles very regular. You can practice different styles, okay? Absolutely. But I just feel for me, I need to focus my training to one thing. It takes, it takes a lifetime time to master one way of moving, let alone too many ways of moving, okay? Um, but again, please, this is not to say that you don't experience that to a certain extent. This is the opposite, is to say that I believe in that, but you absolutely need the perspective of other movements if you want to even enhance your practice. 
but specifically about capoeira, I have the idea that I would like to learn from a certain lineage and have my mind open for everything else. Okay. So one technique that I used was because when I was working on a cruise ship, for anybody who doesn't know, I worked on a cruise ship for a while when I was a young, a young boy. Um, well, I was um, 18 years old before I moved to England. I was very lucky because the ship was in Brazil. So although I was not leaving my town anymore, I was on the ship. We were in Bahia every Friday. We were in Bahia. Then we were in Búzios, you know, Rio de Janeiro. And uh, it was a, a time where I really traveled Brazil, you know, because the ship was just going in all these wonderful places. But there was a time where I was quite alone in terms of training. Um, Messi Casquinha was an important person for me there because of, obviously we did train, but before he arrived, I spent some time training by myself. So I used to arrive an hour, sometimes two hours before the show. And I just felt, I was quite young. And if I feel like that now, you can just imagine how I felt when I had just left my academy. So although I'm in Brazil, Although I can see capoeira, I can train capoeira and so on, I'm no longer in that safe place where I can just come in the morning. I mean, my father owns this school. I, can, I have the key of this school. I can get there in the morning and I could be the last person there, close the, the school. And in my lunch break, I can make a berimbau. That's a life of a capoeirista that you want to live. Um, Oh, that's the life that I wanted to live, which is to spend time doing what I love doing. So anyway, when I was in the cruise ship, I didn't have any of that. You are literally on the boat, what are you actually doing that? <laughs> so I used to get there two hours before the show and just train. So some days were very, very tough. Now I did this for a long time, it wasn't one off, it was months and months of that. And I really improved. And one of the reasons why I improved is because I, I got into a, to a, pl a, a place where I was just flowing. So I, you know, the first weeks I was training this and then I was training that. Other weeks I put a little chair in front of me and I would move. Now I set a task that I would move for five minutes without any interruption. Now this is the technique, we, we own, the, own the ticket now, we own the money now. So I would move without any interruptions. And in the beginning it was hard, I felt that I would pose somewhere, or that I would do something. So everything had to have a thread. It didn't stop, like a thread, continuous movement. And after, after some time, I got very good at that. And if it doesn't sound too far-fetched, it when I got really good at that, it's like I was moving and way everything just opened up. The space opened up in front of me. Now I was down to 40 minutes, half an hour, 40 minutes, a half an hour really good, and 40 minutes in total where I could feel that that was getting a little bit weaker by the end, maybe getting tired or whatever, but certainly a half an hour solid without any pause, without any sharp, even without even sharp movements that stop, just a meditative state of flow. Now, I can only tell you that for me, that was very powerful. It worked, it really worked. And, um, I took that as an experience that for me was a discovery. Later I found out I was at the place, which is one of the, the studios that I work, and I spoke about this. This is a few years ago, um, and this guy then gave me a book. There is an interesting book about flow, and it's a, it's, a it's a scientific approach to flow and all the artists that um, you can see them in flow when they are performing at the best of the uh, the best performers. You can see that and anything from sportsmanship to 
to dance and to writing. And, and the book's fascinating, but the book for me only confirmed something that I read new. I did not know to express in the same way, of course, I'm not a writer, but it did confirmed us you know it's nice when you do something and then you get backed up a little bit by other other means or, or by science and you go this is great you know there's some there's some truth in this best of all is that the more you look even the more you try to debunk this theory stronger it gets you start to see that if you want to play the devil's advocate into no you don't need to flow you start to see more and more evidence of capoeiristas that have a beautiful flow and you can it's so pleasant you watch that and it's contagious good flow is contagious now that's that's a practice of course there are many times when you play capoeira that you cannot constantly flow it shouldn't become an obsession that you know because you are interacting with someone else you are interacting with someone else that may not flow so you need to actually have an idea of that fluidity, fluidase, for you to be able to outmaneuver that as well, or even bring the person into, try to bring the person into that state of flow. Now, another thing that I speculate is that I see some great games of capoeira, and even times where these masters may not be physically flowing in that state of f fluidity you know they may be stopping into a position because something's happened they're waiting for something to happen but the ones that you know have mastered this idea this water-like idea it's like they stop physically but things keep moving the mind doesn't stop there and then goes there you make the body stops but it's almost like when you watch a pianist playing and you can see that pianist is in most flow and you may slow down a note but he's still feeling the music in the body I mean great pianists move their body when they you know, they don't just play like that they have a, the music wants to move them so they can even slow down a note or even stop but the notes are still speaking the notes are still singing now in capoeira that for me is the same you master flow and the body can stop but the notes are still moving your body is still expressing itself still singing um so uh, maybe we have um we spoke quite a lot about that now but it is a great beginning to think about i really hope inspires you guys to do that practice of um, continuously moving and i'll tell you something else that is tough to do it's to do that without music i i think that's very powerful okay so you will move with music the music will inspire you put your favorite cup with the music move with that but you need sometimes to do that in silence you need to hear your own breath how do you come out of your breathing when you start to move after five ten minutes you will hear that your heart is trying to you know your heart is, is, is speeding up and your breath start and then how do you master this i tell my students that how do you get your body to no, so let's say you're speeding up let's say you're literally speeding up your movement that means your heart rate is going to go high up more how can you do all of that but you still look effortless control your breathing less through the mouth more through the nose so we don't want to be <sighs> breathing like that you're going to control the breath through the nose and look like your heart is not going crazy now, that is a capoeirista tool. I train when I'm training with my students and we're moving, I'm doing a negative, a negative, and I tell them, as soon as your heart rate goes up, you show straight away that. Why? You shouldn't have to follow. 
he shouldn't have to follow that as soon as my heart rate goes up, I've got to move even faster and their heart rate goes more higher and then you've got to move faster to the point that you cannot do anything else. So we should be able to get that movement going but control the movement. So that becomes this contrast between what's happening inside your body and what you are performing. And just think of a dancer doing that. How could that, would that dance, how the ugly really would look if a dancer it's really showing that the movement is getting faster or more or more continuous and that shifts completely um, your cool. You're no longer cool just because you went fast. It shouldn't be like that. So this would be the first page of this book. And uh, then obviously in the next blogs I would like to talk about the, the other pages and what they represent to me. Um, they have helped me and still do. And now and then when I feel like is there some, there's not much in my mind in terms of practice, I need to look at notes again. So I'll stress the point that make notes are important. Now, if you are not someone that makes notes often, and maybe you don't want to do that because you don't know how to, you know, what do I write? Well, you just write anything down. You write anything down. Even if it's, today I trained this. It was great. That's it. Get, get again. Again, the idea of, of uh, this to flow. Start with one line, two lines. You come to a point where your writing will have that flow. And you it's, it's so good to bring from here to the paper. These are just different ways of preserving your knowledge. The most important is the time you spend in a studio. So I'll be in a studio, my book will be my body. You want your body to be your biography. But of course, you can video that, you can write it down. Now, to be honest, I've, I'm using video quite a lot. Okay, I think video can be an important tool to keep the memory, to archive what you do. Um, I'm even even my Instagram. I get quite excited to the fact that I can go back lots of. Oh, last year I was doing that, you know. Even for the archive thing, it's it's been very helpful for me to have the Instagram. It's just quicker to upload a quick video, a sequence, or a movement, or a great moment in, you know. But sometimes I feel that writing down and and just practicing, it's more important then we don't want to become obsessed with everything we do with film. The danger with that is if in your heart you are then just doing that to film, to capture in the camera. And, and I, I don't know how to, to deal with that yet very well uh, because I come from a time in Capoeira that we just didn't have that. Guys, we did not even have video camera. I don't want to sound like I come from a place where I was really behind because other people did have video cameras, but we didn't. You know, most of the films, my, my teacher, I was very lucky that my teacher was concerned with um, archive. Well, I have lots of notes from my teachers. One day I will show you, they are pretty cool. I have one book from Mestre um, um, Gato Preto when he did a, a class in my, uh, with my father. And uh, there are notes of that, it's fascinating. So my father was concerned with archive and whenever he could, when someone had a, a friend or, or someone, literally there's one class that someone was passing by with a camera and he asked to film. And then, but we didn't have a, a video camera to record. So I did not know what it's like to train and think, oh, am I filming this? And I wish some people can experience that now. What is like to be in a studio without any thought of filming? But I must admit that I've caught up with this now and sometimes I do a movement and I feel, oh, I, I, I wish I've recorded this now, you know. So perhaps it's, I'm 
glad I don't come from this time because I know what it's like to to just train in the studio. You can imagine you are in Bahia in an event or, or I don't know, you are somewhere and there's a beautiful moment that happened just with you and someone else in your capoeira life. Could be a teacher, could be a friend of yours, you two are playing the berimbau, really nice. One of the best memories I have in my whole career was one day in my school that I was sitting down with a friend of mine and we both started playing berimbau and we just, that's it, we were in another planet, you know, and that's a very happy memory. And you know what, in that, for, now that I've experienced, that I have experienced that and I, I know what it felt like, I even, I'm glad that no one filmed. <laughs> but others, I wish someone did film. So, what I'm trying to say here, not to get too complicated with this, is think about and practice for practice sake, for the improvement, and have a sometimes a soft approach to that. Um, so, next vlog, I will um, talk about another chapter. And as I mentioned to you, some of the points are the bananera. Okay? All right, guys. Thank you so much. And uh, I hope you've enjoyed. And uh, see you soon. Um abraço. Tchau, tchau.